Yo, this is Mike Taylor right here, lock in with this exclusive interview with my man, Stacy at Crown Hoops. What's up, everybody? This is Stacy Carter II representing crownhoops.com. And today I have a very special guest with me. Let me read off the long list of accolades this guy got. <laughs> Seven times overseas champion, the first player to be drafted out of the G League into the NBA. With the 55th pick in the 2008 NBA draft, the Portland Trailblazers select Mike Taylor from the Idaho Stampede of the NBA Development League. Played yeah. in the big three out of Wisconsin. We got Mike Taylor here today. Mike, what's going on? What's going on, man? Appreciate you for having me. Appreciate you, you know what I'm saying, being interested in my story and everything that we're doing. Man, let's get let's get right into it. Right. <laughs> Appreciate you coming out. All right, the first question I got, tell the people about the mental aspect of your long journey in basketball. Like I said, you, you were the first player to be drafted out of the G League into the NBA. You started at Iowa State and you had some some issues in college, but you got over it. And then you went to overseas, won multiple championships, played in the big three. So I want you to take the people behind the scenes of what's going on with Mike Taylor as you going through this journey. Um, well, mentally, it's been, it's been an uphill battle, um, just mentally. Because like you said, like, I knew I had this vision. I knew I had this dream on what I wanted out of my, out of my career. And as I was in a D league, well, which now is the G league. Right. Um, but when I was in it, it was called the developmental league. Um, so in this process, the whole time, my only mind, and my only goal was to get drafted to the NBA. Like I was just at Iowa State, which I led in points, rebounds, assists, three point field goal, made percentage, everything. You know what I'm saying? Turnovers too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, like, I already knew that what I wanted up out of, you know what I'm saying? Myself, out of my career and everything. So being able to be the first person to do anything, like nobody really understands what it is because it's never been done before. You know what I'm saying? So as I'm going through it, it's like, I know how important and how great it is, but everyone else around me is like, don't understand it, don't realize it, don't see it. Still to this day, like, a lot of people don't know who's the first player to be drafted out the D League to the NBA. And this is history, not just NBA history, it's American history, it's black history, right? <laughs> um, so it's been a mental battle because I still feel like to this day, I'm an NBA caliber player. I've won, correction, eight championships overseas. Eight championships. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I won a D-League championship as well. So to be the first player from the D-League to go to the NBA, when all, every other player that was coming from America was in college. And I felt like I've always had the upper hand on them because I shot 38% from the three point line. I knew the defense of three seconds. I knew proper spacing. I knew professional terminology. You know what I'm saying for screens and and just just a, just just the professional basketball. So I knew those things, um, and man, when you're speaking about just the, the just the mental behind the whole thing, I mean, only now that I'm doing what I'm doing now, I'm able to get a little bit of peace from it. Being overseas, my whole overseas career, I felt like. I was just a lost talent, right? I was one of these lost NBA players that had the talent to be on a playoff team, a key six to eight man role on any NBA team, 
I'm just lost in the overseas pool, right? So. Uh, take us through your, um, your, your year with the Los Angeles Clippers because that's the team that you ended up on for that mm-hmm. season. Uh, how was your experience playing with the Clippers? Um, first off, it was one of the, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's every kid's dream is to play in the NBA. It was like a little test question. <laughs> Everything I say is... Oh, 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 my. What a jam. Ralph. Mike Taylor. Ralph. Uh, that, 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 that's a guy about 6'1 doing that. Well, that's like a top five in-game dunk. <laughs> that, that's something special. Especially every black kid's dream coming from where I'm from. You know what I'm saying? Milwaukee, Wisconsin, growing up in poverty. You know what I'm saying? Uh, watching my mama struggle. Like, that's the ultimate goal is to get drafted to the NBA. So in that aspect, it was like the most wonderful thing. That's like the best thing I could imagine. That's the top of the top. That's the pinnacle of, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the professional sports. The, it's, the, it's the top of playing professional basketball. You know what I'm saying? It's the NBA in the world. You know what I'm saying? So in that aspect, it was wonderful. Like I couldn't take back the experience. I wouldn't take back the experience. But as far as do I feel like I had a fair shake in the NBA? Do I feel like my talent was accessed properly? No. Um, I, I still have mixed feelings with that, you know what I'm saying, that single season in the Clippers because it's like, it was a lot of politics going on, right? And. I was better than the rookies that I came in with. A lot of other players on my team was injured and they was fighting injuries, fighting injuries and I was ready right then and there in the moment. But because I was a second round pick, the 55th pick, the politics came in, right? Um, Eric Gordon, who was the number eighth pick that year, the number seven pick that year, for the Los Angeles Clippers. At the beginning of the season, I'm better than Eric Gordon, just flat out. I'm better than him, skill-wise, potential-wise. I'm better than him. I know the game. Like I said, I had a head, I had a head up above these guys. I did three years of college. I went to junior college. Like that's a that's the test. Yeah. Right. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm so I have experience, right? Junior college, two years of junior college experience. A year at Iowa State where Kevin Durant, this is Kevin Durant's year, his single year. Kevin Durant had one year in the Big 12. I had one year in the Big 12, right? Me and Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant is the leading scorer all year. I'm from five to 10 the whole year with Kevin Durant, right? (laughs) So just to put things into context. um, So when I'm in the NBA, it's like, at first, I'm getting the, the play, maybe like the first five to 10 games, preseason and everything, I'm doing wonderful. Then it's like Eric Gordon's agent and a politics starts to, to kick in, like, who is Mike Taylor? And it's not like a good thing, like he's been actually, you know, holding his own in his first year in the NBA. It's like, he's a 55th pick in the NBA drive, like why is he playing over the number seven pick? So after this, after this article or whatever come out, um, I go from playing 15 to 20 minutes, starting some games to 30 seconds. (laughs) So um, it was just hard, like some weeks I wouldn't play We'll have four or five games in a week, and I wouldn't play. And at this time, there's no, like, G League for these players who, you know, not playing as much their rookie year. They can go down to the G League and and play and go score 50 points, and then maybe now they get interest from the coach. Like, okay, maybe he can help our team. They don't have these two-way contracts. They don't have these things that now that they have in place for these guys that's, playing in the G League and 
can't play in the NBA. Like, I didn't have a two-way contract. You know what I'm saying? I was just stuck in a situation. So I feel like I made the blueprint to what these kids is about to go to high school and, you know what I'm saying, get a minimum of 500K. Like, I got 15K my year in the D League. <laughs> I got 15K that year. You know what I'm saying? And I made it to the NBA. I'm eating that, you know what I'm saying? Taco Bell every day, Jack in the Box every day. You know what I'm saying? Like struggling, 15,000 and a professional athlete. You know what I'm saying? And I paved that way. So, yeah, man. Your journey is incredible. I'm glad you didn't let that year, the, the bad part, stop you from reaching your goals and you did expand your game to overseas and, and to the, into the big three. Didn't bring it down, smart play. Mike Taylor, number 88, drills it for the Ghost Ballers. Maybe the captain handpicked George Gervin to coach this group a couple of years ago. Here's Taylor, and he hits the three. <laughs> Taylor's on fire right now. So that's, that's great within itself right there. But uh, let's move on to your community work. Like you said, you represent Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you're deeply rooted into the community. I want you to tell the people, like, what different projects are you doing within the Milwaukee, Wisconsin communities? Well, um, as of recently, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm talk about the recent, and then I'm going to kind of go back and kind of fill, fill everybody in. Um, first off, uh, Taylor May Foundation 414.org is where you can find all my information about my foundation and everything uh, that we're about, everything that we're doing for the community, the inner city youth here in, uh, here, uh, here in Milwaukee. Um, Milwaukee is one of the worst places for uh, blacks and brown to live. Um, it's, the, it's highly incarcerated in this area where I'm from for black. The education is, uh, the educational system is failing us um, all across America. In every place where there are black and brown people in poverty, the police has failed to, um, to uphold and protect and serve us um, all, across, all across the world. Um, where people of my skin color and your skin color are criminalized before they even get a chance to get a day in trial, get a day in court, if it even gets that far. We're getting shot before we even read our rights. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, that's one of the overall things that I'm doing here in my community is just shining a light on some of the things that goes unheard. Um, being a voice for the voiceless and hope for the hopeless. Um, so right now, um, I'm just getting ready for a Thanksgiving event that, I'm, that I have going, a giving thanks event that I'm doing um, where I'm going to be giving out 300 to 500 hot meals um, to the community, to the community uh, here in Milwaukee at a local restaurant, a uh, black owned business called Coffee Makes You Black. Um, just planning out all of the, the last little details in it, but uh, we already got the venue space ready. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited to be able to, to, to do some of these things and pull my resources in the middle of a pandemic that a lot of these corporations and organizations haven't been doing the justice that is needed here in, a, uh, in the black and brown communities. Um, also, with the 300 to 500 hot plate meals that we're doing, we're gonna uh, be doing the essential needs assist. That's something that I started during the pandemic to where I help feed families. Um, the goal is 2,000, to have 2,000 turkeys to be distributed to the families. Not only the turkeys, but we have the fixings and everything to complete um, a Thanksgiving meal. Um, so right now I kind of got 1,000 locked in. I'm working on a few more sponsors to kind of take some of the, the financial strains of myself um, off 
so I can be more impactful with my um, with my gratitude um, for my community. So that's what I got. That's what I'm working on right now. Um, also, as far as with my community, um, I'm gonna go back to my, I, I've had my nonprofit organization since 2009. When I was in the NBA, um, this is something that I've always been connected to. I've never been detached from the city of Milwaukee. I lost my best friends here. Um, lost my cousins, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's a lot of blood spilled in these streets. Like, this is my home. Um, so I honestly feel like this is the job for the professional athlete. Like if you're able to make it out of these conditions, you're make it, able to make it from some of the upbringings, the humble upbringings in which, you know, we were fortunate enough to navigate the way out. I feel like that's the only purpose is to show those who come from where you come from and are not able to have the the vision to see something out a long way to give them that inspiration to know that it's possible right um so from 2009 like before uh before social media and everything was popular like i still do this from my heart right and it's still hard for me to like record myself doing something that's just like genuinely and coming from a pure space. Like it's still hard for me to like record myself and do these things because it's not for attention. It's not a it's not a photo op. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not for none of those things. It's because I came from a single black woman and I know how hard it is and the struggle that we all go through. And that's one thing that I know that we all can relate to. We all wanna compete and go against each other. But I know one thing we all can relate to and that's the struggle and that's suffering. And that's just how I try to relate and be transparent with my people. Like, even though I've made it to this level level to where everybody wanna say I'm a celebrity or I'm famous and I never wanted that. I never wanted to be a celebrity. I never wanted to be famous. I just wanted to help my family and help my people. And, and that's what I'm doing with my foundation. Um, so just to give a little rundown. Um, so I've been doing Thanksgiving drives, book bag drives since 2009. But around 2016, I made a new initiative to kind of be the face of it because I was overseas a lot. I would just have my mom, my sister, and everybody do it in my name. So just being overseas for over 10 years, I've been able to see how I can be more impactful from afar, from a bird's eye view, just looking and seeing, you know, how America life is from an overseas and an international mind frame. So around 2016, I made this initiative that I would be the face of my foundation and I would take a lead in my community and I just stand for what's right. Um, just out the righteousness of my heart. So, um, I knew I had one of the greatest stories that's never been told. Like I was the first player to be drafted out of the NBA. Um, so this has been on my mind since 2009. So not being able to tell this story was kind of, man, I would say it's a mental health issue. It was like traumatizing for myself, not being able to know that I've done something that no one has ever done before, but not being able to express it and let my people know and let the kids know that it's possible, right? So. Um, I started writing a book then, and right now I'm actually in the process of publishing a comic book. Um, 
So that's kind of what I'm doing recently. Um, go ahead. You probably asked me another question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you are saying these things. It's very inspirational in me coming from uh, St. Louis. You know, uh, I hope to be, I hope to be in a position like you are, where you use your platform to give back to the community. So I'm glad that you like saying those things because that's very inspirational to me. Give me something to look forward to. I mean, and that's just that's just my that's my goal. Like the highest. The highest human act is to inspire. Right. And that's like my motto. I believe everything starts within. When we talk about inspiration, like what I'm doing for you is more so motivation, right? It's motivational. But what I teach is that your inspiration must come from within you, right? And then now that that gets the next person up and motivated or inspired to do something that comes from within and not coming from me on the outside of you, that it's never going to work. If you get inspired from me doing something, it's not going to work because you're only going to do it so far or what you see my success is. But if it comes from within, now you have a vision. So if anything outside of you, if anything outside of you slow you down or the world, life is going to happen. It's going to happen. So problems is going to happen. But if you have this foundation and this base that's tailor made, right, then you will be able to navigate through life's trials and life's tribulations. And then one testimony will have purpose. Right. Yeah. Appreciate that. Hey, um, what's next for Mike Taylor? What's next for Mike Taylor? Uh, as far as life in general, or even more specifically basketball, like what's next for you? Where are you trying to go next? Um, man, <laughs> I'm trying to go. I'm trying to go to another atmosphere out of this world. Um, um. What's next for Mike Taylor is, I wanna be able to show people my creativity on a business aspect. I wanna be able to let people know that I'm more, way more than a basketball player. Basketball was just the easiest way that I can express myself. Um, but it's only like a dot in a cosmos of who Mike Taylor is. Um, so I'm working on um, creating a community center here in Milwaukee. And that's one of the things that's the highest on my list is um, having a community center so I can run all of my events and everything that I'm doing out of, I can have a home base um, and I can really impact uh, the culture here in Milwaukee and have my influence be impactful on a grander scale, not just here in Milwaukee, but all across the nation and eventually international. Um, I'm into telling stories. I feel like I've experienced a whole lot. And I started my comic book um, with this vision to, to be able to tell so many stories within telling my story. So it's not just about my way or my path. It's about this journey that all of us are on. And um, being able to break down the underlying stories or the elephants that be in a room of these stories being told, I feel like I'm creating a space for the younger kids to, to, to explore themselves and, and unlock their true greatness, right? Um, I wanna be able, 
I want to be a spokesman for the for the D League, for the G League. Mm-hmm. I was the first play, I was the first person to be drafted from the D League to the NBA. I feel that it's only right they're choosing high school players to skip college to come into a, a big business, into a corporation. And I've been able to brand myself and I've been able to do things on my own. So I know the value in which these players don't have no clue of, of right now. So I want to be able to, you know, be a spokesperson or ambassador for the G League and the NBA. Because I was the first person to do what they're about to pay a minimum of half a million dollars to 18 year olds, to 17 year olds, right? Um, Man, we can go on and on. I go for about an hour about, you know, um, where I'm headed and, and where I'm going. Um, I'm still active. I'm still an active professional. You know what I'm saying? So, like, my basketball career is not over. Um, the big three is, you know, coming around due to the pandemic, it was closed. Before the pandemic, I was in Egypt playing in um, playing for Zamalek. So I'm still an active professional. I don't want people to think that I'm retired because I'm talking about all the other stuff. Like, I'm still active. Like, I believe I believe I could, you know, play for the Milwaukee Bucks. You know what I'm saying? That's one of my goals, too. I've never played here in Milwaukee. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's one of the things that I feel that I deserve with my career and everything. I felt like I sacrificed my career. Um, just by putting, just by doing it the hard way. I haven't had an agent for eight years and I've been overseas. You know what I'm saying? So since about 2000 and I say 12, 2013, I've been my own agent. I have no American agent. I just been doing everything strictly by myself. So when we speaking about business and when we speaking about all of these other things, it's like, I've been the owner of my name. I've been the owner of my brand. I've been the owner of, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is not just a basketball player. Like a basketball player usually has an agent and only cares about what he's doing on the court. I've been having to make sure that off the court things are, because I don't have no agent. You know what I'm saying? So it's not somebody that buffers the, the, buffers the, the confrontation between a player and a coach or an agent and a coach or the culture or however it is, there's no buffer in between that. I ha- I've been dealing with the general managers, the assistant managers and the GMs and, and all of this on my own. The owners, I've been dealing with them face to face, changing the things in my contract so they're catered to my needs because I'm the one who winning these championships. I'm bringing this culture. I'm bringing this spirit. I'm bringing this mindfulness to this team to work, right? So that's another thing that, you know, I'm promoting. Like a lot of these kids get wrapped up with agents just because, you know, an agent is selling them a dream that they gonna make all this money. It's not, it's not true. It's not true. Half of the countries that you sending them to overseas, these agents ain't never heard of, never been. You know what I'm saying? So it's a game inside the game. And I just want to teach the business inside of basketball for the kids who's not going to get this information, for the kids that do make it through, right? For the kids who don't got a parent, you know what I'm saying? Don't have fathers who played basketball or went to college or, you know what I'm saying? Played in the NBA or had NBA experience. Like I didn't have no older brother. I didn't have no father that made it to, you know what I'm saying, the next level and taught me the, the, the professionalism and stuff like that. So I feel that it's only right to give back this part of the game to, to the younger kids that's coming up who, who misunderstanding, frustrated, confused, don't know the options. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my, I feel like that's my duty. And I feel like that's the duty of every professional athlete. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Before before we go, before we go, got a little yeah. fun question here. All right, obviously you, you play basketball. We all know that. Who's your top five players in the NBA? Like your favorite top five? 
in the NBA right now or yeah, over? Right. Uh, right now. Right we, now. We right now, yeah. Ooh, that's a tough question. That's a tough, tough, tough question. Okay. Top five. I'm going to go. Dame Dollar. Okay. Um, I'm going to go Marcus Smart. Mm. I'm going to go let me see Jimmy Butler. I'm going to go so I got Dame, Marcus Smart, Jimmy Butler. Um, let me see. Um, I like maybe a two year ago, Patrick Beverly. <laughs> maybe like Patrick Beverly two years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, who else I'm gonna go with at this last pick? I'm gonna go Montrez Hero. Okay, those 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 mentally tough grit and grind players. Yes, th- those the type of players that I like. That's not gonna care about what shoes they got on. They don't care who in the crowd. They don't care about nothing. If it's a loose ball on the floor, they're gonna dive on the floor and get it. Nice. It's you know yeah, like I, I'm I'm gonna say as, as a LeBron fan, I I'm a little disappointed as a LeBron fan. I, I was waiting for LeBron to come up. LeBron would never come up in my, in my, <laughs> oh, none of my top fives. He oh. would never come up in none of my. If we talking about off the court, I, LeBron might be number one off the court. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like I respect him as a man, as a person. But as far as the basketball talent, skill, skill wise, he's not high on my list. There's so many players that are more skillful than LeBron. Like, as far as like the offensive game, like show me one LeBron move right now that he that he go to. Show me a LeBron move. <laughs> uh, I mean, he does got that 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 weird three point shooter shooting thing. That's not a move. <laughs> I, I was trying <laughs> to find something. See what I'm saying? Like, I need a move. If if you could say like. What's LeBron go-to move? Is it a one dribble pull-up? Is it a two dribble pull-up? Like, what's something that consistent that he go to? Is it a post-up? Is it a fadeaway? Like, what is something that he consistently does to where you can count on this in the last two minutes clutch time? Right? So I'm looking at it from a real basketball standpoint. Like, I've made but I've I've made buzzer beaters in game winning shots. And in the last two minutes of a game. I'm taking the the crucial decisions and a, and a decision making, and I just feel like skill wise, LeBron James has never really increased in his free throw percentage. If you're going to be the greatest of the greatest, oh, you shoot ninety percent. You up there, Kobe. You up there, LeBron. You up there, Steph Curry. You know what I'm saying? Like he shoots like seventy percent from the three point yeah. line. For the free throw line, for the free throw line. Like, so how can you be the greatest player of all time? And in the clutch time, all I gotta do is foul you, you may miss one. Yes. So to me, that's not considered the greatest. I'm not with the fame, I'm not with the popularity, I'm, I'm not with that. You know what I'm saying? I wanna see what's really going on. Dame Dollar, what's gonna happen when he got the ball in the clutch time? It's a bucket, right? Right. You know what I'm saying? Phoenix. Kobe Bryant. That mentality, like that's why I just I just like Allen Iverson. I like that killer, killer be killed mentality. And LeBron's mentality is more passive. It's more of a Magic Johnson. It's more of a, you know, which is fine. But that's just not my preference. You feel me? Yeah. Oh. I got you. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was this was interview with Mike Taylor, the Mike Taylor. Uh, uh, plug your social medias right quick for everybody. Okay, okay. So first off, before the social media, y'all can check me out at MikeTaylor88.com. Shout out to my guy, uh, Jordan Daly, for, you know, 
you know what I'm saying, working with me on that on that website and for my foundation uh, website too. It's tellermadefoundation414.org. Tellermadefoundation414.org. And my uh, personal website where you can find everything about me, basketball, the brand. Um, it's MikeTaylor88.com. On Twitter and Instagram, it's 88MikeTaylor, at 88MikeTaylor. Um, Facebook is just Mike Taylor. Um, and that's how we doing it, man. So, again, I appreciate you for having me. Um, and I look forward to, to, to getting on the podcast with, you know what I'm saying, you and the Crown Hoops a little bit oh, yeah. later, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. That was just the end of the interview. That was Mike Taylor. I am Stacey Carter, second representing Crown Hoop Stop. It's the glass. Taylor pushing it hard, gets to the basket, and lays it in. He looks like a New York City point guard. <laughs> Taylor leaves his feet and hits. Wow. Mike Taylor. That's right. Mike Taylor has 19 points. And you're right, Clyde. It's a season high prior to.